Hello folks, and welcome back to another case study segment where I discuss and analyze some of the strangest and most baffling cases out there. Well, as I mentioned in the previous video, I'm going to be doing something a little different from time to time. And in this instance, I'll be diving into the waters of true crime territory, which follows the brutal, quadruple murders of four students in a sleepy little college community. So let's go ahead and get that ball rolling. November 13th, 2022 is a date that will forever haunt the small college community of Moscow, Idaho. When we hear the name Delphi, we are immediately reminded of Abigail Williams and Liberty German, the two young girls that were taken from us back in 2017. When we hear the name Moscow, Idaho, we will forever be reminded of Kaylee Concalvis, Maddie Mogan, Zena Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin. Even if this case gets solved, November 13th, will most certainly be talked about for years to come, and that dark day will forever leave a stain on the collective minds and the memories of those who were around during this new chapter in Moscow's history. Now instead of regurgitating everything that you probably already know about the case from news coverage and other online sources, I'm just going to go ahead and begin with the most recent facts and we'll go from there. By the end of this video, you should have a brief summary of the case and maybe a few questions of your own. If you're still unfamiliar with the case, go ahead and Google it so that way you're up to speed on things and that we're all on the same page. Every day, new information comes forward pertaining to the case and in fact, it could be overwhelming at times. Even after 40 days since the crime, no suspect has been identified. As of December 21st, 2022, the latest update follows that of an abandoned white Hyundai Elantra that was thought to have been at or near the scene of the crime when it happened. But after investigating the vehicle, Authorities have officially ruled it out as having any connection. So what's next? Well, authorities are continuing to analyze thousands of tips they've received, as well as all the video evidence collected showing the girls in their final hours. Let's go ahead and take a look at the home where the quadruple homicide took place. Just to give you an idea of what both law enforcement and investigators are up against. Located at 1122 King Road in Moscow, Idaho, the off-campus, three-story home was the primary residence for three of the victims. For reasons unknown, two of the girls who lived on the first floor, or the basement level, were spared, as well as a dog named Murphy that lived in the house. However, Zanna and Ethan, who were on the second floor, along with Kaylee and Maddie, who were on the third floor, weren't so lucky. Standing alone from the surrounding neighborhood, the home is somewhat secluded by comparison. Behind it, there are a group of trees that separate it from a parking area that accommodates a nearby apartment complex. In the front, the tenants share a large driveway and parking lot by the main road. The home was seemingly built into the steep contours of the landscape and is highly visible from the surrounding area. This unfortunately makes it an easy target for evildoers. Anyone set on committing the crime had an easy vantage point where they can see inside the home through one of its many windows. Some refer to this as the fishbowl effect. Aside from this, the home was known as a party house. Just months before the murders took place, police responded to the home about a noise complaint. 
They arrived to see a party taking place inside the residence in which none of the actual tenants were present. This was telling to me because it just goes to show you that anyone could have had access to the home under those conditions. Those who knew the victims also confirmed that people were always coming and going, which only complicates the investigation, and I believe the killer knew and took advantage of this. It's not hard to imagine someone out there in the dark, watching the house, taking notes, and gathering information needed to plan the attack. Hell, the person may have been a regular at the home, attending parties and gatherings, attempting to blend in with the group. The scope of suspects only widens as we continue to learn more about all the different people involved in the victims' lives. The home was a beacon of social activity. One of the many questions we've been asking this entire time is was this targeted? If so, it was most certainly personal due to the severity of the attack as the victims likely knew their killer. Jealousy, drama, revenge. Well, there are so many motivating factors to consider here, but let's say the victims didn't know their killer at all. What exactly would this mean? Robbery was ruled out earlier on. So it could be that the students were singled out by someone who may have been watching and waiting for the right opportunity. Whoever did this picked the perfect time to do the crime. They did it with ease, stealth, strength, speed, and confidence. As far as we know, the perpetrator left no viable evidence behind, which leads me to believe this was well planned and executed. Now it's possible that DNA evidence may come forward after forensic investigators finish their lab work, whenever that may be. But in the meantime, we can only work with the puzzle pieces at our disposal, and we just don't have many at this time. The problem is, there are too many potential suspects to consider here, and until we have any hard evidence connecting these individuals to the crime, I will try refraining from using their names as much as possible, as they are innocent until proven guilty. But I will say, there are some red flags with one of the neighbors who waited weeks before revealing he may have heard a scream that night. And that was well after he was initially interviewed by reporters, where he doesn't mention this little detail at all. He's an interesting guy, and some professionals who saw the interview believe there may be some deception involved. However, authorities don't seem to believe he had anything to do with this. So how about Hoodie Guy? Hoodie Guy was seen in surveillance footage, along with the girls, after leaving the corner club that night, and also at the grub truck. Well, it turns out this individual knew the girls and was there to quote-unquote make sure they got home safely. They have since ruled him out. Now, the girls' ex-boyfriends were also looked at. After all, if anyone had a motive to do this, maybe they would. We've seen this in other cases where the ex-boyfriend just couldn't take no for an answer. It's that whole mentality. If I can't have you, no one else can. Still, this motive doesn't seem to fit the severity of the crime. This feels deeper. On the night of the crime, police body cam video shows Sigma Chi frat students being cited for underage drinking at Band Field. There's a lot of speculation about this footage, and many believe there are clues within the video that could prove useful to investigators. Now, Band Field is a large field that separates Sigma Chi fraternity from the victim's three-story home. Now, given how close in proximity these two properties are, that definitely raises a red flag. I'd also like to mention that in that same video, 
There were a group of what looked like joggers in the background, and to this day, none of these folks have seemed to come forward. What were these joggers doing running around at 3 a.m.? Now it's possible they were also drinking and decided to run from the police. I believe that's probably the most likely scenario, and it's typical. I just can't see a group of people pulling off a crime of this magnitude without one of them slipping up or coming forward about it. As we know, group secrecy almost always fails. And I'm sure by now investigators would have pursued this. I believe whoever did this acted alone or may have had a getaway driver. Earlier in December, a new name came forward, James Curtis Leonard, a convicted killer who was arrested for a domestic disturbance. Not only does the guy have a criminal background, he was found to have cuts on his arm during the time of his arrest, of which was only a mile away from the victim's home. Many were confident that this may be the guy police were looking for, but after intense investigative efforts, well, they soon rolled him out as well. Just last week, new surveillance from the night of November 12th showed the girls and hoodie guy walking from the corner club to the grub truck. In that video, you can hear Kaylee asking Maddie, Maddie, what did you say to Adam? Maddie responds with, like I told Adam everything. Well, this new discovery seemed to change the gears of the investigation. Naturally, many folks were looking into this Adam fella, but soon thereafter, police stated that they do not believe he has any connection. Other potential suspects have been kicked around as well, including the landlord and even Kaylee's father, even though police cleared them earlier on. So where does this leave us? Well, right now it appears the only lead investigators have is finding the white 2011 Hyundai Elantra mentioned earlier. But are we getting tunnel vision here? What if this car had nothing to do with it at all? Like many of you, I hope police are giving a second look into those who were cleared earlier on in the investigation. Family members have been outspoken about this issue and also believe that police clear too many of these folks too early on. I would have to agree with them, and we've seen this in other cases where the suspect was initially interviewed and cleared. If none of these folks mentioned above had anything to do with the crime, well then we need to take a step back and look at other possibilities. How about a handyman? Was the home being worked on? Or was there any sort of maintenance being done on the property around the time of the crime? Were there any red flags leading up to it? How about any delivery drivers or taxi services? Were any of these individuals exhibiting odd behavior? Were there any transients known to be wandering around the neighborhood? How about anyone with an extensive criminal background? Are there any more Curtis James Leonards that we need to know about? Well, like we've seen in other cases, the suspect usually ends up being a repeat offender and that the clues were usually hidden in plain sight the entire time. Now, how about a serial killer? The longer the case goes on without a suspect, the more the scenario seems to take on water. Could this very well be a random attack? whom, for whatever reason, could have targeted the girls based on looks, social status, affiliation, or who knows. Perhaps the victims represented something that gave the killer a motive. Now, earlier in the investigation, there was speculation that the victims were bullying other students. But it didn't appear that anyone came forward to confirm this rumor. But if it were true, well, revenge could most certainly fit the bill. With that said, I do believe it's quite possible that we may be dealing with a serial killer who's done this before. 
Now was this individual a transplant to the area? Are they blending in with the student population? Or are they just passing through? There are so many questions, and unless we receive more information, it's hard to know which direction to go from here. I think what makes this case so baffling is the large amount of people involved with little to no evidence pointing to a suspect. Well, this is a true mystery, all right, which is why I decided to cover it. Now, I've only scratched the surface of this, and it goes much deeper. I could easily spend days talking about all the details involved, but we'll save that up for another video. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up for now, and wait until some new evidence comes forward before slapping together another video. In the meantime, feel free to leave your thoughts and opinions below, and fill us in on any details that you may have. We're also hungry for answers, but we must not lose sight of the facts shared by law enforcement. There's a lot of misinformation floating around out there, so do your research before you jump to any conclusions. Stay focused, stay patient, and good things will most certainly come. Aside from that, I sure hope you all have a fine holiday season, and be thankful that you don't have to go through what the victim's family is going through right now. My condolences go out to them, and I look forward to the day that the cold hand of justice is served. Thanks for listening, and you'll hear from me soon.